everyone, and welcome back to Pinpoint History. We are here today with the Romans again in 375 Common Era. As a nice little recap, we have Valens as Augustus in the east. His two nephews are now co-Augusti in the west with Valentinian dead. The term Augustus means emperor, derived from the first emperor of the Roman Empire, Augustus. Caesar usually implied that you were the current successor to the current Augustus. Just as a little quick brief uh, recap. So, we have 16-year-old Gratian in command of Gaul, Hispania, and Britain. At the same time, his younger half-brother Valentinian II was in nominal control of Italy, parts of Illyricum, and North Africa. While in reality, Gratian was in charge of the entire West, as his brother was only four years old. The death of Valentinian had shaken the hierarchy of the empire, as now Valens was the senior Augustus in the empire, with the two junior rulers in the west. For Rome to remain stable and peaceful, careful planning and crucial decision-making needed to be practiced. So that's obviously what we got, right? Huh, if only. During his brother's death, Valens had been deep in the east in Antioch due to the frequent instability of the Roman-Persian border. Things, however began to go from bad to worse for Valens. Across the Danube in the Gothic realm, Hunnic migrations forced the Goths out of their own territory, forcing them to choose between fighting the Huns or attempting en masse to enter through the Roman borders. This meant that a buildup of Gothic refugees began to migrate towards the Roman frontier at the Danube. At first, the situation did not necessarily mean disaster for the Romans. An influx of Gothic refugees meant that the Gothic men would join the Roman army as a part of entering the empire. The adoption of foreign soldiers into the army had been an age-old custom going all the way back to Julius Caesar having Germanic cavalry in his army. The difference here, however, was the scale of refugees that began piling up on the Roman doorstep. Still, the influx could be managed if handled with adequate care and attention to detail. So, remember when I said for Rome to remain stable and peaceful, careful planning and crucial decision-making needed to be practiced? Well, that's the opposite of what we got. Soldiers known as the Limitanii guarded the Roman frontiers. The issue with that was that the Limitanii soldiers were few in number. Modern scholarship is divided between the Limitanii being part-time soldiers or more professional soldiers. The enforcement of the Roman borders had been left to the Limitanii, and the bulk of the eastern soldiers were currently deep in the eastern territories due to Persia's on and off again threat. Can I just quickly mention that the Shah of the Sassanids, Shapur II, ruled the entirety of his life from 309 to 379. This guy's been beefing with the Romans for at least the last 52 years. From Constantine the Great to Constantius II, Julian, Jovian, and now Valens. That's five emperors, and Shapur has warred with them all. This dude is a certified hater of Rome. The period of Shapur II from 309 to 379 is also considered one of the golden ages of Sassanid Persia. It shows what kind of stability a state can go through when it has a consistent long-term ruler. The exact type of stability that the Romans needed desperately. The Romans needed a strong leader. The duo Valentinian and Valens had worked because of Valentinian's firmness as a leader. Valens was an able administrator but lacked the firmness of his brother. This is also just my interpretation of things. I always recommend doing the research oneself to come away with your own point of view. With the Goths at the Danube, they sent messages to Valens in Antioch asking for asylum. When the news arrived, Valens contemplated what to do. Many of his advisors were quick to point out that allowing the leader of the Goths and his followers' entry would be a major boon to the army. They could absorb many able fighters into the military, as more and more citizens of the empire did not want to join the army. Emperors in the past had to resort to the conscription of citizens from the border provinces to fill the ranks. The main groups of Goths that Valens was dealing with was led by a chieftain known as Fritigern. Fritigern and Valens had kept up correspondence during the 370s. Valens allowed for Fritigern and his peoples to cross through the border. Still, 
Other groups of Goths had also come seeking asylum from the Huns as well. Now here is where the problem really began. Admission into the Empire was supposed to be limited. If you've listened to Mike Duncan's History of Rome, you'll remember the five rules he detailed when it came to allowing admission into the Empire. Rule 1. Disarm the people being brought into the Empire. It may seem obvious, but allowing armed people into your borders does not bode well. Rule 2. You gotta break them up from each other and disperse them into smaller groups throughout the Empire. Rule 3. They must abandon allegiance to their old chieftains and kings and accept Roman authority. Rule 4. When fighting for Rome, they must fight with Roman weaponry under Roman commanders. The fifth and final rule is that they must be met with a show of force when allowing them into the empire. There must be soldiers, and they must outnumber the immigrating groups of people. Virtually, none of these rules were followed. On top of it all, the corruption and abusive practices the Romans at the borders would engage in would set the Goths off in a violent frenzy. And you can't really blame them for the response. Now, you're thinking to yourself, what kind of abuse will set off people into a group of frothing rage similar to when I stubbed my toe? Well, let us turn to the words of Amias Marcellinus, one of our primary sources of the era. Going to get my Shakespeare voice on. At their head were two rivals in recklessness. One was Lupicinus, commanding general in Thrace. The other, Maximus, a pernicious leader. Their treacherous greed was the source of all our evils. I say nothing of other crimes which these two men, or at least others, with their permission, with the worst of motives, committed against the foreign newcomers, who were yet as blameless, but one melancholy and unheard of act shall be mentioned, of which, even if they were their own judges of their own cases, they could not be acquitted by any excuse. When the barbarians, after their crossing, were harassed by lack of food, those most hateful generals devised disgraceful traffic. They exchanged every dog that their insatiability could gather from far and wide for one slave each, and among those were carried off also were sons of the chieftains. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Well, that's a great question. Let me break it down for you. After Valens allowed Fritigern's Goths into the empire, two generals named Lupicinus and Maximus came to the Danube to regulate the immigration into the empire. Ammianus Marcellinus does not have good things to say about these two, calling them immoral and greedy. After the Goths crossed the Danube, which did not go smoothly, with many people drowning in the crossing, once they got into the empire, Lupicinus and Maximus quickly realized they did not have enough supplies to feed the Gothic migrants. So here is where we begin to see how the Romans went from handling things poorly to full-blown incompetence and corruption. Instead of breaking up the groups of Goths into smaller numbers and spreading them around the empire, they let them stay in place and exploited their situation. Allegedly, the Goths became so desperate for food that they sold their children to slavery for rotten dog meat. It's hard to say if that's true. Still, we are reading this from a Roman source who could have covered it up. But regardless, I do not doubt that the Goths faced severe exploitation during this moment. So while the Romans are in the midst of currently mismanaging this entire debacle, we get another group of Goths at the door pleading for entrance into the Empire. Yep, that's right. I wonder what could go wrong here. The leader of this group of Goths is known as Alavivius. I'm using the term Goth as a catch-all phrase, but the groups under Fritigern and Alavivius identified differently. Fritigern, unable to handle the treatment of his people, migrated his people further east to a more prosperous region in Thrace, nearby the city of Marcianople. Due to this movement, the Romans were forced to follow Fritigern, which left the Danube virtually undefended. Alavivius and his group of Goths had been denied entry into the empire, but due to a lack of troops and supplies, you know, all the fun stuff Fritigern's group had been going through. Of course, once the Danube was virtually undefended, 
Olivia simply turned around and decided to head back home, right? Yeah. I think we all know what's about to happen next. Olivivius and his Goths crossed over the Danube and, once in imperial territory, began to pillage the countryside. Lupicinus was soon informed of the crossing of the other Goths and decided to settle the matter swiftly. Lupicinus sent invitations to Fredegern and Olivivius to diplomatically handle the situation, telling them to come to Marcianople to talk it all out. You know, a little schmoozing. Sorry for selling your people into slavery for dog meat, Fredegern. Honestly, my bad. And sorry for denying you entry into the Empire, Alivivius. We're a little jam-packed already, but hey, you made it, right, buddy? Let's enjoy the feast and talk it out. What are we, barbarians? Oh, right, you two are. My apologies. I didn't mean it offensively, you know? Wait a minute. What am I doing? Am I bargaining with barbarians? Jupiter, forgive me. Guards, kill them! So that was my dramatic recreation of the conversation between Lupicinus and the Gothic chieftains. If you're getting deja vu, that's because in the last week's episode, the Romans did the same thing. Lure them in, have a nice dinner, and then boom, kill them. After this red wedding of sorts, Alivivius was dead, but Fertigern managed to escape. Pausing briefly, I wonder what the big plan was here. To tell the Goths, I have murdered your leaders. Take that, you barbaric pieces of scum. I imagine killing a group of foreign people's leaders in your land and then leaving them leaderless is probably not in the Empire's best interests. They might get a little mad about it, but that's just me. I'd probably handle the political killings a bit differently if I were in charge. After Fertigern's escape, he rallied a group of armed Goths to begin raiding the surrounding territory in retaliation. In response, Lupicinus rallied the Limitanii troops and marched out nine miles to meet the Goths in battle. Estimates of this engagement have about 7,000 fighting Goths and 5,000 Romans. Weapons and armor-wise, the Romans had the advantage. Still, they were overwhelmed by the Goths, with the majority of the Roman soldiers being killed on the field. Lupicinus fled back to the city, probably crying internally about the mess he had created. In the aftermath of the battle, the Goths rearmed themselves with superior Roman weaponry. So, you know, that's a nice two for one. At the same time, Lupicinus sent out dispatches to Valens, letting him know how badly he screwed up. Fertigern's success also saw his forces begin to swell, with other Goths and Roman deserters and slaves joining his forces. While the victory over the Roman forces had given Fertigern some breathing room and an influx of warriors, The Gothic position was still precarious. The increase in soldiers also meant a need for more supplies to feed their forces. Due to the crisis period Rome went through over a century ago, the major cities in the empire now had fortified walls surrounding their towns. Many of the tribes outside the empire had little to no siege experience and did not possess any siege works. This meant that the Goths were unable to effectively press the advantage their victory had gained them. Meanwhile, the Romans began their preparations to return from the east to deal with the unfolding Gothic nightmare. Valens started peace negotiations with the Sassanids and began transferring his troops westward. The troops Valens was moving back were the backbone of the eastern legions, the cream of the crop. Valens also sent letters to Gratian in the west for assistance. We'll do a more in-depth look at his reign next week as well. Gratian began marshalling his own troops to go assist his uncle in dealing with the Goths. Much of 377 was spent in guerrilla combat with smaller contingents of forces fighting each other, with the Romans attempting to bottleneck the Goths in the mountainous regions of Thrace. It began to become clear that the Gothic problem was not going to go away. With half-hearted attempts not working, it was clear that a significant show of force was going to be necessary. Valens began to pull more troops from the frontiers to crush the Goths. At the same time, Gratian marched east with his army, planning on overwhelming the Goths with superior numbers and elites from both armies. Here is where things began to get tricky. With Gratian marching a bulk of his forces east, the Alamanni began probing the Rhine frontier with raids to see how well defended it was. 
While these initial attempts were turned away, it was just a hesitant testing of the defenses. The prelude now over, the Alamanni, now aware that the bulk of the Western forces were marching east, invaded with a much larger force. Gratian was forced to march back to quell the invasion in the heartlands of his own territory. He raised more troops and crushed the Alamanni, acquitting himself brilliantly. This brings us to 378 now. Gratian, now back in the west, was hesitant to leave a skeleton force behind, as he had done previously, and the campaign from the west had stalled for this reason. Valens returned to Constantinople by May in 378. Valens, however, was pressured by instability in Constantinople. Riots broke out in the city due to the fear of the Goths and other religious matters. Valens set out into the Balkans. Before Valens' arrival, he had sent a general out to keep the pressure on the Goths. His general had been quite successful. Valens' scouts had placed the main force of Goths nearby the city of Adrianople. Valens began to push closer to the main Gothic body. Now here is where I'm going to engage in a bit of pop psychology and even armchair general in a bit. One of Gratian's generals had made it to Valens, imploring the Emperor to wait for Gratian so that they could fight the Goths together. Valens had always been second fiddle to his brother Valentinian. Now Valens was the senior Emperor. He was the big dog. Gratian, earlier in the year, had repelled the Alamanni invasion, winning glory for himself. Valens probably wanted some glory for himself. Not wanting to share it with his nephew, Valens held a war council with some of his generals advocating for attacking now. In contrast, others recommended waiting for the arrival of Gratian. In the end, Valens decided to fight the Goths with just his forces. So now, it brings us to our fateful day, August 9th, 378 CE. Valens left the city of Adrianople in the morning. It was a hot day. The Romans had to march in the heat and over rough terrain for 8 miles, or for us civilized folks, just shy of 13 kilometers. The Romans, around noon, finally faced the Gothic forces ahead of them. The Goths had arranged themselves in a semicircle to defend their wagons and caravans where their baggage and non-combatants remained. Estimates raged that the Goths had around 10,000 fighting men, while the Roman force numbered 20,000, with the armored East Corps being the Eastern elites. Fritigern began by sending fake treaties for peace so his allied cavalry could return. Envoys went back and forth, and for a few hours, the Romans, after enduring a long march in the heat, were now forced to stand in the sun, baking in their armor. Eventually, during the back and forth settlements, a contingent of imperial cavalry located on the army's left wing set off towards the enemy. The small contingent of Romans was overwhelmed by the Goths who responded. As the Roman forces began to retreat back to the main body, Fritigern's allied cavalry arrived, a force of 10,000 cavalry. They appeared in front of the Roman left wing, and seeing this, Fritigern charged his full force toward the Romans. The center of the armies on both sides was infantry, and they engaged in brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The turning point for the battle was the left flank of the Roman cavalry being routed, and they fled the battlefield. This exposed the Roman center to a flanking assault. Now the Romans were forced to fight head-on in an attempt to fight the charging cavalry as they punched into their exposed side. With this, it was over for the Romans. They fought for the remainder of the day, but they were overcome. Two-thirds of the Roman army lay dead at the end of the battle, and Valens was among the perished. There are two accounts for how Valens died. The first being that he was struck by an arrow and died on the battlefield, his body never recovered. The second was that he survived the initial battle and retreated with some bodyguards and found a cottage to stay the night at. The Goths, ecstatic from their victory, had begun plundering the countryside and attacked the cottage he was in, setting it on fire without knowing that the Emperor was inside it. Either way, Valens never lived to see August 10th. So this seems like an excellent place to end it for now.
Balin's dead. Two thirds of the Eastern army dead in a field, and the Goths victorious. Next week, we'll talk about the aftermath of the battle and its effect on the Empire as a whole. We'll also discuss Gratian's reign before the battle and what happened after the battle. We'll talk about it all next week on Pinpoint History. Let's get it.